So, hello everybody. Uh, so, my name is Brendan Buffler um, from AWS. Uh, you'll, you'll quickly find most people here call me Buff. When I, when I grew up as a kid in Australia, it was customary to slice all of the syllables off your last name until there was one syllable left. And this is just how it works. So, thus it's stuck. Anyway, so, um, I kind of suspect that a lot of what I'm going to say today is not actually really going to be new to you all. Uh, but I want to remind you of a few things because I think um, there's, a, there's an aspect about what you all do that's getting, uh, that's getting lost or maybe not transmitted to the wider world with enough impact. And so I kind of want to get this across to you. Um, you, could, you could, the, the, the cloud bit here is, is important to the message, um, but, but what cloud it is actually is, is not entirely consequential. Uh, a lot of these things apply across the board, and, and we'll discuss why that matters later. Um, but let's first talk about, you know, why we're all here and, and so forth. It, it, we, we, we often overlook this. I spend a lot of my time, I build supercomputers for a living and cloud clusters for folks. And we, we kind of overlook, you know, when we're, when we're diving into the metrics of what's going to make something successful or... Uh, what's going to be the, the way that we're going to measure that success. We often get stuck on things like, you know, the price per core hour or the number of megabytes per second of memory bandwidth and stuff. All those things are important. However, um, it kind of gets eclipsed by this one fact that it takes decades to grow a new scientist. And they're not very scalable. Um, I mean, even though you're all locked up for two years in COVID, Phil... I mean, Phil was busy uh, with producing more children. Um, <laughs> I wonder how many of the rest of you were. And of course, the latency for that loop is really quite long. It's going to take a couple of decades before those kids are going to become functional members of the scientific community, actually several more decades after that. So it takes a long time to grow a new scientist. It's not a scalable process. Um, let me just point out the obvious. Computer cores are cheaper and more readily available, even you know, notwithstanding supply chain constraints. Um, but you know, these kids need to grow up in a good household, nurtured at school, do well at school, go to university, lots of study, eventually discover that they can be poorly paid as a postdoc, <clears throat> poorly paid again as a researcher, maybe some of them, like me, well, I actually escaped far sooner than that. I'm a recovering astronomer, so you've all got to be kind to me here. I did bring some bioinformatics goons with me uh, from my team. Are they up there? Um, they'll actually answer the hard questions. Um, but I'm a, re I'm a fully recovered astronomer. Um, I got out far too early because I, I wanted to travel the world. Anyway, this is besides the point. But it takes an extraordinarily long time to build one of these new scientists. So and it seems odd to me that after passing, you know, filtering society through all of these filters that are decade-long filters, we stick them in a queue again, um, and we give, them, you know, we give them access to these great high-performance computing tools that are going to really allow them to change the world, and we ask them to wait for six hours or 12 hours to act. We're not doing a very good job of actually working out how to share resources, I guess is the bottom line there. Um, and, and, you know, when it takes somebody decades to acquire these skills, it, you know, it's really important. And I think COVID is, you know, what we saw during COVID is the quintessential example of what happens when you get all those blockages out of the way. You know, we, we've got a lot of pharmaceutical companies who are customers and Nextflow users as well, by the way. Um, they were not fussing about memory bandwidth per core metrics when they were trying to find treatments for COVID and, of course, discovering vaccines for COVID. Um, they were just getting busy doing insanely large runs so they could explore every opportunity. Every scientist had all the tools that they needed to be able to do work. Um, and that's not because we did anything amazing. We just happened to be a good sharing mechanism for sharing large pools of infrastructure. Anyway, um, we, we eat some of our own dog food as well, uh, and this is important, and it, this is kind of a good example as to why. Um, this is the principle we work on inside all of Amazon, is that um, it's always good, by the way, to quote your CEO. It's, 
if you're watching Andy. Um, anyway, um, it, you have to be able, you know, it, it, discovering new things and doing new things requires the willingness to fail. Uh, most experiments fail, right? You all know that to be true. Um, it's the one that works that leads you to the next one and the next 10 failures, by the way, before you get to the one after that that works. These are all important. If we can lower the cost of failure, if we can make failure cheap and fast, then we can get somewhere quickly, right? Um, I'm not sure if anybody's seen this little dude. Has anybody seen this? I was sitting in my office, like, I don't know, it was maybe a year ago, and I was watching you know, some company webcast thing on my computer while I was doing some, some work, and this thing popped out as a new device. Now, I, I kind of always knew that there was, this was going to happen in my lifetime. I just wasn't expecting it that week in particular, that there would be a little, I don't know, canine robot from Doctor Who that could follow me around the house. Um, now, when they were designing this, and this, is, this comes from the team that, that uh, you know, they build the Alexas and all the other, you know, contraptions and devices we build as a company, um, this is more or less their cycle of working. They, you know, have a bunch of background activity that they're doing, uh, you know, on their cluster, compute, compute. They're studying the structural, you know, integrity of the corner of a, of a device. Uh, does everybody remember when we had a fire phone? That small moment in time when Amazon decided to make a phone. So, you know, structural integrity is tested. You know, we have to, we have to understand what's going to happen when somebody drops their cell phone. We do a lot of structural integrity tests. There's thermodynamic tests to understand what happens when the phone gets too hot or it's set in the sun. There's a lot of work that goes on. And then, of course, with this little guy, um, do we make him white or black or whatever color? All those things have impacts. Um, so that gigantic spike in workload is really just a weekend where our folks got challenged in a meeting with the vice president who was about to hit the, the go button on the production line or at least on the sending the, sending the dies off to the, to, the, to the factory to start making parts and challenged everybody on whether this was a, a great thing to do. Can we change the color? Can we change the fabric? Can we change some aspect to it? Now, um, if, if they were running in a fixed environment and they didn't have access to a cloud like you guys do, they, then, then more or less that gigantic spike would have taken about another three or four weeks to do. Um, and, you know, we, we sort of understand the relationship between time and money, and so we figure that waiting three or four weeks to make a decision that we can get done in a weekend um, uh, is actually kind of a crazy thing to do. So it's an example of just, you know, um, eating our dog food in that regards. Now, a lot of this is just a side effect of scale, right? And we are aggregators of scale. Um, if, if nothing else, this is, this is what we do in the cloud. Um, the left-hand side is, of course, you know, what it looks like when you build your own cluster on-prem. Um, the right-hand side is what it looks like when you spread those work clouds out, out over time uh, where they can get access to whatever they need when they need it. Um, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, the interesting one is that uh, the, guy, the guy at number seven on the left-hand side, he really just wanted a bit, of, a bit of resource every few days. But in a classic scheduling model, he's going to have to take it all at once in a small amount of time, and he's probably not going to get access to it again for a month. So we can, we can change all of those parameters, and we can have jobs traveling back in time, in, in an effect, uh, when we work in this highly elastic environment. Now, workflows don't like fixed-size boxes, because you can have the entire cluster go dormant while you're waiting for one particular step to execute on a single-threaded node. Um, and then you can have hundreds of things waiting um, for, for a cluster that's overstretched. So, you know, these, these, the elasticity feeds this invention. Now, um, I, you know, I've heard, I've, heard a, you know, I've heard a lot of comments so far about, uh, I think there was a, a question that Phil answered about, you know, don't look outside your local directory um, if you want to be able to, you know, make these things more cloud portable. You know, we, we, we like to hear that feedback. We need to hear that feedback. And we're constantly trying to work out if we can invent new things to actually solve those problems uh, and make those things go away. Um, AWS Parallel Cluster is the thing that, that canonically looks the most like a, a normal traditional HPC cluster. Um, do have a look. It's, a, it's, got, it's got this ability to spin up 
uh, large fast parallel file systems. We've recently taken that large fast parallel file systems uh, techniques and applied it to a lot of other file systems. So um, just last week, we, we launched a thing called, um, I think it's Amazon FSX File Cache. Um, is the correct name, and it actually takes a Lustre file system and will apply it over any other, well, multiple other file systems like S3, like an NFS filer. The NFS filer could even be on your own data center, uh, and it will cache everything in a, in a Lustre layer and present it to your cluster. May solve some problems for some of the stuff here. However, um, I think AWS Batch is the thing that more of you are probably familiar with if you're, you know, if you're running your next low pipelines on AWS. Uh, and that's mainly because this thing is an always on scheduler. When you're not using anything, it's just sitting there waiting for a job. It's not costing you anything, which is a, a good feature. Um, Batch is responsible for some of the largest workloads that we run in the cloud into the millions of cores. Uh, we regularly have million core workloads running during the day, running in batch. It's gigantic. Um, it does allow that awesome scale up thing. The other nice thing about working in this environment is you can also scale things down as well. Um, and so we've got this very large public data set program that we run for, uh, you know, and, and I think Phil's using it in, as part of the NF core work that he's doing. A lot of you have probably accessed it before for 1,000 genomes, TCGA, any number of different data sets. The good thing about these is these are petaclass data sets. Instead of you having to have, I don't know, half a million bucks so that you can buy the infrastructure to run a $25 analysis against them, you can run a $25 analysis against them um, without having to do all that. So, that, so there's, a, there's a scale up and a scale down, and there's a much more sort of democratizing aspect to all of this as a way of arranging access to shared infrastructure. Now, um, and I'm not going to sing. No, that would not be good. Um, I'm going to get Angel to sing. That's what we should do. Um, uh, this is just a, I, I just want, sort of want to, this afternoon we decided that, that we have a project that's just ready to go live, and we've just hit the button and made it go live. So um, the entire biocontainers repository, all 9,000 plus of them, and that number has probably changed in the last 20 minutes, uh, just went live in a mirror on our thing called ECR public, which is the Elastic Container Registry. And so if you're working inside AWS, this is gonna be your fastest way of actually pulling uh, bio containers. They're all there, uh, you can pull them. They're actually, they live in a couple of regions, and the way that ECR public works is it hosts them in a couple of regions so that we've got you know, multiple copies of them, um, and then it puts CloudFront, which is our edge networking layer in front of them all. So regardless of what region you're in, you're pulling them from a local source and it's extremely fast. Uh, now, if you're out there on the wild internet and you're not using AWS, there is a free tier that just allows you to get, I think it's 500 megabytes of download a month out of this uh, for just pulling. So if, if, you're, you know, if you're running into cache into congestion or some of the bandwidth and rate limiters on the other, on the other repositories, um, ECR Public has got your back. You'll get half a terabyte a month of, of uh, bandwidth available for nothing. If you, use, if you register your pulls with your AWS account ID, we extend that to a, to a five terabytes per month free tier, even if you're pulling them out over the internet. And if you're, of course, if you're pulling them inside the cloud, it costs you nothing. Um, and you can pull them as much as you like with unlimited access and go completely nuts. Anyway, there's a, there's a blog post uh, linked to at the bottom. We think this is kind of cool. We think this is gonna be a good way to, to keep helping that biocontainers community sustain itself uh, and to be able to, to have a lot of other people sustainably using these, you know, these containers and keeping their pipelines running. So um, if you want to know more about that, talk to either Angel or Matt um, afterwards. Um, ply them with a, with a drink and you'll get even more interesting answers. Um, now, I, I sort of just want to finish with a, a couple of things, a couple of thoughts, and I think this is my request to you all. So. Um, this is a molecular modeling application. I got this slide from the team at SPAC. Is everybody aware of SPAC? It's a very cool thing if you write high performance computing software that's got a ridiculous number of dependencies. Um, uh, this, th this bit of code, it's a pretty small tool. It's got like 175 dependencies on packages that live underneath it. HPC software is insanely complicated. 
Every single one of those packages has a life cycle, has an open source community like this one maintaining it, um, and a whole sort of life cycle of activity that goes around it. Um, you know, we're, we're working with the SPAC community because we think that that is a sort of very complementary open source community that we really want to see supported in the same way that we, that we love working with the Nextflow community for the same reasons. There's really good things that come out of it. But, um, you know, this software is insanely complicated. It shouldn't be insanely complicated to use. And that's, you know, that I'm gratified that what Secure has done with Tower is to, to get all this stuff just that one more inch closer to the user in a much more usable way. Uh, I think it was our first speaker who said, you know, that, that, that the scientists don't really want to do bioinformatics, they want to do the research. They care about the science, not the compute. That should be the truth. Um, Nextflow is doing a really good job with that. This multi-platform aspect of Nextflow, you know, this, you know, when I'm having conversations with pharmaceutical companies and they say to us, you know, what is the best, what is the best technology we should be using to implement our workflows on AWS? Um, honestly, the answer that I give back to them is that these workflow engines, in particular Nextflow, where we do see such great work being done, this is the right way to do it. We could, you know, and, and I guess depending on the circumstances, sometimes we do recommend our own workflow engine, step functions and so forth. But the thing that really gives customers confidence is that they're not getting locked into an AWS way of doing things, they're getting locked in, well, they're, they're driving into a path of the bioinformatics way of solving a problem. Um, and it makes them free of, of any lock-in. Those, those are good things. Uh, and these, you know, there's many of the reasons why we love supporting this community. It, it, it gives customers confidence to, to have that trust. But the other thing that all of this is doing, and, and you know, this is particularly, um, particularly important for things like Tower, things like Nextflow, things like NF Core, is that you're pushing the user up a layer and giving them a bigger, more interesting set of tools that's closer to what they do, to the research they do. You're giving them knobs and dials they understand rather than things they have to tinker with and cross their fingers about. So, um, you know, the, the bulk of scientists indeed do not want to know about what the computer's doing. They just want it to do it and they want it done quickly because then they can get to the next experiment or the next idea quickly as well. Um, we don't do email like this. Uh, anymore. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't sit down and type SMTP commands at port 25. We use applications. Sadly, this means we send more email, and that means I receive more email, but that's kind of a perverse consequence, isn't it? Um, but, you know, that we've made people productive by giving them great tools and great interfaces. Don't give up on the quest for providing better interfaces and better UIs and better documentation for your users. These are all really important things. Um, I will, I'll, I'll finish by saying thank you, but uh, so I'm much more inclined to actually just say this, that, you know, life is short. All of you are those people who took decades to grow. Um, and unless you're like Phil and you've been reproducing uh, fruitfully very recently, and you've got the kids in university already, um, Think about what you can do to not waste your time and not waste your users' time and those other people that you're supporting. Um, you know, I wake up every day genuinely trying to work out how we can smooth the path so that people can just get, get their science done sooner. That's what I'm paid for. Um, uh, I hope you do the same. I hope the folks downstream from you are doing the same. These are all important things to do because uh, what we did witness during COVID was just an absolutely amazing impact that came from unleashing people's creativity and inventiveness and resourcefulness um, to produce some of the, you know, the result is that actually we're all, we're all sitting here today within six feet of each other. Um, that's an incredible result. We really, really didn't think that we'd be doing this a couple of years ago. So. Um, thank you for everything that you're doing. Please keep contributing to this community. We think it is remarkable. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Booth. We've got one question firstly from Paolo, um, commenting that the, the bio containers on AWS is, is really nice, very, very useful. 
Do you have any ideas of, of supporting different uh, architectures there, particularly like ARM, et cetera? Yeah, um, we're absolutely looking at that. Um, it's a good question. So uh, we, we just, I just got some, I got some email a couple of weeks ago from the Barcelona Supercomputer Center. We've been doing a bit of work with them testing bioinformatics pipelines uh, on our Graviton. And, and if you haven't heard of it, our, the AWS Graviton is our ARM-derived chip. It's an ARM-sourced uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, CPU that we build ourselves and we deployed in our cloud. Um, turns out the memory bandwidth in those things is off the charts uh, in the, the Graviton 3. It's DDR5 memory if you're a, a hardware junkie. Um, and that, plus a few other handy features, um, has caused the, you know, that we've noticed some, something like a 40% reduction uh, in cost uh, for the same compute time um, on those things. That's, you know, everybody's sitting up and paying attention to this now. It looks like it's a particularly interesting thing. So, um, yeah, we're ab absolutely actively working on that angle because if we can, you know, if folks that are running stuff inside one of Phil's NF Core, pipelines on Nextflow, on Batch. So far, nobody's mentioned a CPU or a particular implementation detail. If we could give you an easy button to switch over to a different architecture and everything just looks the same, uh, but chop your bill by 40%, we think actually a lot of people would think that's cool. Um, you can do that now. I think the missing piece is, the, is actually the biocontainers repo on ARM, and that's something that we're act actively working on. So, so, bu so building the software essentially for all the, for the different... Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there's 80, 90,000 containers that would have to get built. Yeah. Something like that. Um, um, that's, you know, and if anybody in here wants to join us in that effort, um, we would love to hear from you. Uh, come and tap Angel and Matt on the shoulder um, uh, over drinks, because if we can solve that problem, it's, it's a sheer brute force uh, and probably an awful lot of stuff that I'm going to gloss over. But I think there's a brute force attack that needs to be done on this to, to just throw a hell of a lot of cores at it. Uh, and I'm, I'm willing to sign up to that. So, Moritz is asking, it may not be known yet, but what's the, what's the current status then for NF core uh, modules essentially using those biocontainer images? Is there already some code changes has gone or it's just this is the very beginning i think um <laughs> you, you, had, you have had five minutes already <laughs> yeah yeah we told you like at least an hour ago uh when you saw the slides um that blog post there contains some of the details um it's it's not that hard it, it quite literally it is just uh it's just changing the name we've kept all the path the same etc it is just changing the name, and there's, you know, if you're, particularly if you're using Nextflow, you can actually provide preferences for which, which repo you, you pull from, depending on what context you're in. So if you're in the cloud, you pull it from here. And another question here, which is around uh, concerns around using cloud, uh, particularly with pro processing patients' data. Uh, it's often it's often not possible to do because of uh, because of issues. Are you seeing discussions there changing, things happening with government institutions? With regards to that? Yeah, I, I think it'll be, um, uh, to, to whoever asked that question, come, come talk to me. I mean, we, we've worked, I haven't found, we haven't found a, a customer site yet, except in some, you know, maybe, I don't know, Antarctica, um, where we did not have a region that was within a, you know, within the right place to be within bounds. In, you know, in Europe, for example, um, uh, we, we can meet, I believe, all of the compliance uh, 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 rules that we have to meet in order to be able to hold PII in just about any jurisdiction. So I think that it's a solved problem. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna pretend that it's an easy one. Uh, there's, probably some, there's probably some details. There's a lot of details involved, particularly given how divergent and different, um, different jurisdictions governance are. But you know we've got we've got folks who live and breathe that stuff for a living and can close that gap for you. So um, I think it is it is as far as I'm aware possible almost everywhere. Awesome. 
A question from Adam about what is the, the best way of migrating traditional HPC users into a more cloud way of, of working? It's an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting question. I think the, the best way to answer that is it, it depends, um, of course. Um, I think, uh, you know, I, things like Tower make it quite easy to actually manage workflows across borders between your physical infrastructure on your site and the cloud. Um, I think Tower has done a really good job of being able to abstract a lot of those things away and then make it visible where the flows are and where the data movements are. Understanding your data movement is actually the, the first step in that hybrid scenario. Understanding that you may not need to focus on the data movement is also another aspect. We get, you know, in, in virtually every domain, bioinformatics and, and all sorts of others, we have a lot of customers who are asking about how do we migrate workloads to the cloud, and usually it implies that they, they kind of want to keep one foot on premise and one foot in the cloud. Um, that doesn't have to mean uh, a belief in this mythical thing called cloud bursting where jobs magically transmit themselves into the cloud and so forth. Because there's a lot of details there that matter. Data movement is slow, right? Um, data, you know, da data movement over the interwebs or over high speed wide area links takes time to happen. Um, that may change the judgment about how you schedule jobs. Um, there's a lot of hysteresis around, around that um, that may impact the decision and make it really complicated. When you zoom back and you understand what your data movements are and what your workloads, workload patterns are in your site, you may discover that, frankly, you can create 10% room on your, on your on-prem cluster by just moving this one little group to the cloud completely. It's simple for them, it's simple for everybody else, and you've created the, the space that you needed for everybody else to bend and flex within your, within your infrastructure. So don't, uh, don't overlook that there's maybe some simpler ways to solve the problem by zooming out a bit and looking at and understanding your workflows uh, a little better. Awesome. Well, I think all the other questions have been answered uh, by some of the AWS folks. But um, it's... Excellent. <laughs> and it's dinner time or drinkies time. Absolutely. Well, well thanks so much, Brendan. Uh, let's uh, go downstairs up to the top and we'll, be, uh, we'll take some drinks out, out the front. So thanks, Great. everyone, for the first session. Thank you. Really appreciate it.